There's the magic words. Um, good evening, and thank you for joining on Zoom this evening for this forum. My name is Adam Gillett, and I am the publisher of the Alameda Post, Alameda's only local news source. We publish Alameda stories covering a wide variety of topics every day to our website, uh, to our social media platforms, and other news aggregators around the internet. If you prefer your news weekly, we uh, you can sign up at alamedapost.com for our free weekly newsletter. It comes out every Friday morning. And don't forget to check out our weekly podcast, our comprehensive events calendar, and our frequent Alameda history articles that we publish in addition to our daily news coverage. As a nonprofit organization, our mission is to inform and educate about Alameda issues. And we're grateful to the League of Women Voters of Alameda for co-sponsoring this evening's forum with us. Both our organization uh, have mandates committing us to presenting impartial, unbiased, and nonpartisan information about candidates standing for election in our community. We share the same goal of educating voters to make better informed choices in local elections without influencing their choice. All four of the candidates standing for the Alameda Unified School District Board of Governors on November 5th are here with us tonight, including Joyce Boyd, Malia Hall, Heather Little, and Jennifer Williams. For this forum, each of the candidates has agreed to the same ground rules, which will be outlined by the moderator. This evening's questions have been selected by the LWVA and the Alameda Post working in collaboration. None of the candidates have seen the questions uh, in advance or have any advanced knowledge of the topics we will cover. I'd like to thank the League for their cooperation and hard work in preparing this forum and getting everyone together and hosting this evening's Zoom. They've been great and wonderful partners in the planning and production of this year's forum and are a great asset to our community. Thank you also to all four candidates for being here this evening, and thank you for bearing with us as we reschedule to this uh, alternate date, and we wish you success with your campaigns. We're grateful for your initiative and for your participation in today's forum. Most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us this evening. We know you found this forum to be informative, and we thank you for making time to learn more about these candidates. We'll share the recording online for those who couldn't attend uh, this evening or uh, wish to watch it again. Uh, again, the Alameda Post is nonprofit, so if you enjoy this programming, we'd appreciate your support to produce more events like this in the future. You can make a tax-deductible donation to our operations by visiting alamedapost.com. Now, without any further ado, please allow me to introduce from the Alameda League of Women Voters, this evening's moderator, Anne McCarrigan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. And again, thank you all for joining us today and for the Alameda Post for co-sponsoring this um, the school board forum that we'll have this evening, I, as was mentioned, will be your moderator for this event. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government and fights to make democracy worth work through education and advocacy. The League never supports or opposes candidates or political parties. It does make recommendations on ballot measures based on review and existing positions. As noted, the candidates have agreed to participate under the ground rules set for this set forth for this forum and that this is an educational event, not a debate. We are recording the forum and we'll be posting it via our websites and YouTube for the broader community to access. Four candidates are here for the three open seats for the Alameda Unified School District Board, and all candidates were invited to participate in this forum. Each candidate will have up to one minute to deliver their opening statement. Questions for the forum have been solicited in advance from the community, and we will not be taking questions from the audience. We have screened the questions to ensure that they are fair and unbiased and to avoid duplication and anything inappropriate. The order of answering the questions will alternate and each candidate will have a two minute period to respond. Following the, candidate, following the questions, each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. So we'll be beginning with our opening statements and they have, will be assigned in the order of appearance on the ballot. So candidates, if you're ready to go, Joyce, if you'd like to give your one minute opening statement, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joyce Boyd, and I'm a parent with two children who uh, are in the Alameda School District. Uh, when my uh, I moved to uh, Alameda in 2001, and when my daughter started at Payton Elementary, I wanted to make sure that the school and the district had the resources they need. So I was a room parent, uh, PTA, school site council, I'm also on the citywide PTA, and uh, I am the chairperson of the Parcel Tax Oversight Committee. 
Um, and um, a year ago, I began attending the school board meetings in person because I wanted to be ready to be a school board member. Uh, also, my career has been devoted to community service. I'm a certified public accountant, and I've been the CFO of several nonprofits, and community service is very important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Malia? Hi, everyone. My name is Malia Hall. And almost 30 years ago, when I applied to Stanford, I wrote in my essays that I wanted to work in education, and then I wanted to reimagine education, and then I wanted to specifically work with students with autism. Well, I've taught for 20 years, and my creative and research-based teaching paradigm has been um, very successful. I've, I've seen two, three to four years of growth in literacy within a year. I've seen over 300% increases in some test scores, specifically with students in special education in math um, in a few months. Um, I have received awards for my creative teaching. I've received pro a state assembly proclamations. I have experience at all levels, K to 12. I also was very influential in developing a dual language immersion program, which I think would be a powerful program to bring here to AUSD. Thank you. Thank you, Malia. All right, our next opening statement will come from Heather. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Heather Little, and I am seeking re-election uh, to my second term on the AUSD school board. Uh, I have been very honest with people that when I originally ran for election, I thought I would be a one and done uh, candidate. Uh, but having spent the last four years and realizing what an amazing group of people I am currently working with, uh, it made me realize that the work that we've done over the last three to four years uh, really isn't enough for me. Uh, we've been lucky enough to pass a parcel tax while I've been on the board, to pass a bond measure for our facilities while I've been on the board. We have a uh, historic raise and benefits package this last year for all of our staff members where they get to enjoy uh, uh single payer um, healthcare for all of our employees. And this is just the beginning. And I feel like four more years is what's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And finally, Jen, if you'd like your opening statement now, that'd be great. Thanks, Anne. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jennifer Williams. I'm currently the president of the AUSD Board of Education. I think the question for voters in this election is, is the school district headed in the right direction? And I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, as you drive through Alameda, you can see all of the facilities upgrades that are going on at most of our school sites, bringing our classrooms into 21st century learning. We have a thriving TK program. We have all day kindergarten now. Both of those things are new within the last couple of years. We have a strong relationship with Alameda Family Services, who's in all of our schools, ensuring that the mental health needs of our students are being met. We've recently adopted curriculum upgrades and math and social studies. We've added ethnic studies and an AP African-American course, and for the first time in many years, literacy rates for our African-American students are improving. Enrollment is up. Um, chronic absenteeism is down. There's a lot more work to do, and I'm willing to put in the work for another four years with your support. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, now we'll begin with the questions. Malia, we're going to be starting with you. And you will have two minutes to respond. And at any time, because some of these are a little lengthy, at any time, if a candidate would like me to repeat the question, please don't hesitate to ask. So our first question is related to school funding and resource allocation. With tight budgets and funding challenges, how would you prioritize spending to ensure all students have access to quality resources, including technology, arts, and extracurricular activities, where can the ASD get the most bang for their buck? Thank you so much. You know, just recently I was speaking to a student, one of our stakeholders, she was in, she's in third grade, and she said that she only gets art once a month. Now we know based on research that art, music, hands-on learning is, um, critical for brain development, starting from a very young age. And so I think for us to be able to get to 
making sure that our, all of our students have access to um, curriculum that is good for their development. I think we have to be fiscally frugal. I think we have to hold budget sessions where community members are invited, where we literally go through every single contract and we see where we can save money. Um, also, another strategy is looking at the technology platforms that we that we use. Is there a way that we could actually design some of these platforms from within? So, for example, as a data analyst, I was a teacher last last year, and as a data coach as well, I built out data dashboards that saved, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, maybe even more than that, um, because I designed them, and the data that we used. Um, the data that we received in, in those dashboards were then used to inform instruction. Um, they, were, they were used for powerful data talks amongst the community. And so I th also think that we need to look at the tools that we have. There's plenty of open source software. And I would love for us to start looking at how much money we're spending on software programs and seeing how we could reduce those costs. I also think that we must continue to invest in special education services, but also we must continue to advocate at the state and federal level, because right now only the federal government funds about 5% of the costs of mandated special education. And we need to be, we need to receive more funds and be fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Heather, Thanks, would you like Pam. me to repeat the question? Uh, no, I think I got it. Um, since being on the board, uh, when uh, President Williams actually took over, she instituted um, uh, having budget conversations at a once a month uh, meeting, a public meeting of the board. I continued that during my presidency, and I'm thankful that she's continued that again during her second presidency. And that has afforded us the opportunity to have all those open conversations, not only with our incredibly smart administrative team, who is actually looking at the data regularly, um, and bringing that forward to us so that we can make the informed decisions to ensure that we are putting the money behind uh, the various programming, um, the various schools, the various um, needs, and taking that all into account when we're making those really hard decisions. Uh, while I was on the board, we made one of those very hard decisions where when we decided to uh, shut down the middle school program at Bay Farm. And we were able to take that money and again, using data uh, to inform that decision, we put that money towards the full day kindergarten programming that President Williams mentioned during her opening remarks. It is using those kinds of conversations, engaging the public, as well as working with our incredibly smart administrative team, as well as with the teachers to understand what those local needs are so that we can funnel and shift resources in an informed way. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, great, well, thank you. All right, let's reset that clock. And then Jen, you're up next. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so I, I, I do think that over the past um, four years, I'd say we've we've significantly changed the way we, we have a conversation with the public about our budget, as Heather indicated. We're much more transparent now. We are having ongoing monthly meetings about um, our expenditures, about appropriations that we make, and we're constantly seeking feedback from the community and from staff about what our values and what our priorities should be. Um, we recently did a strategic plan for the first time and named out um, specific groups of students that have been struggling historically in our school district. And we've made targeted uh, financial decisions to support them. Heather mentioned one of them with the closure of Bay Farm Middle School, a program that was working, a program that both of my kids attended. Um, but when we saw that it was costing the district $350,000 a year over a decade, we had to make some tough decisions about really putting the money behind programs and um, targeted uh, supports for our students that needed it the most. And that's what we've done. We've hired uh, Shamar Edwards. She's, she's amazing. She's our program director over equity and African-American achievement. We've instituted a scholar program with those dollars. And as a direct result, for the first time in decades, literally decades, our literacy, literacy rates for our African-American students are improving. 
So we are constantly looking at our budget, at our expenditures through an equity-based lens. Um, you know, and, and Anne, you know more than more than most, the state situation with funding is abysmal. We are so lucky to have a community that continues to support our parcel taxes, our bonds, and I think they do so because they see us being fiscally responsible. Um, so this is work that will continue, um, that we will continue to be transparent, at least as long as I'm board president. And I think we're actually doing a good job at it. Thank you, Jen. All right, Joyce. Well, I want to start off by saying I think one of the things that differentiates me from the other candidates is I think closing Bay Farm Middle School was a mistake. Um, it was uh, an award-winning school. It was the only middle school on uh, Bay Farm. And um, one of the promises of our parcel tax is to have neighborhood schools. Um, and I also think it meant for, particularly for Bay Farm families, they really lost uh, a, a sort of parent choice of being able to send their kids to a small school. Um, now, I uh, do think that what we have coming up over the next several years is going to be some difficult decisions. Uh, uh, the federal government did provide, you know, across the country, um, fund additional funding, additional COVID funding, and over the next several years, that's not going to be replaced, and that funding is going to go away. Um, at one of the last board meetings, um, it was talked about that uh, in the next school year there'll be eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars less. So. I do think that that means there are going to be some hard choices that need to be made. Um, and I do agree with it, it means looking at the data. It means looking at where money can be saved um, at the same time, needing to continue to provide academic excellence to our students. And um, I, I, I also agree that, you know, arts and music and um the sports programs are incredibly important because those are ways that our students can be engaged um, when they have that kind of connection to the school. Um, I know I found that with my own son, that once he joined the football team, it's like he had come alive. So I think that's also uh, critical for us to keep in the schools. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so our next question, and just so you know, Joyce, you'll be the first one to answer for this one. Um, question two is on the mental health and school safety. According to the California Healthy Kids Survey, 14% of ninth graders and 30% of 11th graders in Alameda have considered suicide. What specific policies or programs would you implement to support students' emotional well-being and ensure safe learning environments? And Joyce, we're going to open with you. Oh, I have to say that that also is um, something close to my heart, you know, uh, that, you know, within my families, there have been some struggles around those issues. And I know that we're fortunate, I mean, one of the things we're fortunate in Alameda is to have a, a number of wonderful nonprofit organizations and that those organizations are connected to the schools. Um, so we have Alameda Family Services, who's been providing services at the schools. And I truly support that because one of the things we have to have both at the teacher level and sort of throughout the district is being able to identify those students who are at risk, you know, at risk of um, harming themselves, even at, at risk of, of leaving school. So I think that's um, critical, and particularly as kids came out of COVID. And we know that, uh, you know, during COVID, you had particularly those who were doing remote learning. There were a lot of issues uh, around depression, around disengaging from school. So I think it has been a very good use of some of that COVID money to provide that extra support. Uh, again, that then becomes a difficult decision as that COVID money goes away. How do you keep providing that? Because teens are going through a time of self-exploration and sometimes that can go to a place that's very harmful for them. Um, I think you also mentioned safety. I did want to address that a bit. Um, I do know on the uh, with the bond money that on the school sites, we're also um, have been building fencing and sort of uh, making sure that the 
school building itself that not just anybody can sort of walk in, that there is more limited access to the site, because I know that safety is a very big concern for parents. So thank you. Thank you, Joyce. All right, Malia. This topic is very near and dear to my heart. I was, um, I experienced a school shooting when I was in high school in Seattle, Washington. Um, and it just happened that day. I was not in the cafeteria where the shoot, where the school students shooting started because I had just launched a peer tutoring program during our advisory period. Um, and so I wasn't at lunch that day. So this has been something that's been very important to me. And in 2015, I actually wrote a petition to OSHA to request workplace violence prevention standards to focus on schools, but also all industry. In the federal government, Log 300 is not mandated to be filled out in public school settings because the federal government deems school settings as, as places where it has a low chance of violence. As educators and as individuals who are involved in the school system, we know that that's not always the case. So my petition was passed and because of that, um, all industry in the state of California has to write workplace violence prevention standards. So if you've if you've had to take more courses and have more training around that, it's it's because of that petition. And from that now there's a Senate bill that was created as well to help supplement that. I think that we should look at how we take care of our students. I think making sure that they're engaged as much as possible. I had an, a before school program where it reduced the number of students who were smoking before school, smoking uh, marijuana. Right now, because of the fentanyl crisis, um, one out of five pills has can be laced with fentanyl. And sadly, many of us have probably had family or friends or acquaintances who have passed away. Um, so I think it's incredibly important that we continue to invest in powerful programs. It's also important to have surveys at the beginning of the year so that families and students can request help so they can have help the first day of school if they need it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Heather. Thanks, Ann. Um, I'm gonna start by saying, Malia, I'm really sorry that you experienced that. It has to be uh, probably the one thing that keeps me up at night the most when I think about what's happening in our schools um, every single day. Um, that said, uh, I have spent the better part of 25 plus years in mental health. Um, my background is in mental health and I currently work uh, for Alameda Family Services. And I'm incredibly proud of the partnership that this district has formed. Uh, it was formed prior to my joining Alameda Family Services, but while I was on the board, I was a huge proponent of it. Um, incredibly honored that this board has continued to demonstrate its dedication to mental health through that partnership, as well as its partnership with Care Solace, two incredible organizations that have demonstrated time and time again that those services and supports that they're providing every single one of our kids in our district with the support that they need. This is incredibly unusual. I, I want people to understand that to have an organization that is fully dedicated and able to provide supports and services to every staff person who needs it, every family member who needs it, every a student who needs it in every one of our campuses, this is incredibly unusual. And it is not just because of Alameda Family Services, it's because this district has prioritized mental health, particularly coming out of COVID, but also recognizing that the impacts of that experience are continuing to resonate still today. My goal, and it kind of ties back to that funding question that we had previously, Anne, is we need to be able to figure out a way to safeguard those things. So finding ways that we might need to shift here and there and make potential sacrifices every once in a while so that we can safeguard the things that are incredibly important is going to be part of the conversation that I would really love to be uh, continuing to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. All right, Jen, if you could answer, that'd be great. Thanks, Ann. Mental health to me is incredibly important. When I ran in 2016, it was one of the things that I wanted to see built up in the AUSD community, and I think we've done a pretty good job of um, making sure we have a district now, as Heather said, where every school site um, has a presence with Alameda Family Services. And we did that by making tough budget decisions. And I wanna go back again 
um, you know, when you have a value, whatever that value is, it often means making hard decisions with the limited amount of resources that that school districts have, that public education have. That's what the Bay Farm decision was. It was about a program that was serving less than 120 kids a year um, and taking those those resources and putting them into a full day kindergarten program that is now serving hundreds of families across the district. And we know from an equity based um, lens that our youngest learners do better when they are starting school younger and in a full day program. So that's just one example of a tough decision that folks need to make when you're on a board like this. And we are going to continue to have to be making those hard decisions um, as the COVID money, those one time dollars run out and we continue to want to have uh, mental health supports in place in our community. And, and I'm hopeful that uh, we will continue to have board members that have the courage to make hard decisions like that. Um, I will also say we've recently updated our anti-bullying policy. Kids this year, all of our students signed a contract, um, being aware of their speech and how negative speech impacts other students. We have better resources in place for victims of um, bullying and stronger accountability for perpetrators. We also have amazing um, relationships with our public safety partners in Alameda, which I think is incredibly important. We do an annual training every year with everybody so that we are fully prepared um, for a critical incident that I hope never happens here. But if it does, I think we'll be, we'll be ready to handle it. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. All right, and Jen, you will be first in our next round of questions. So um, this next question is on diversity and inclusion in education. Research shows that students perform better when their teachers and curricula reflect their diverse backgrounds. What initiatives would you champion to ensure greater diversity among teachers and staff and more inclusive curricula in our schools? Thank you, that's a super important question. Um, I'm the mom of two kids that have gone through AUSD schools and, you know, they're biracial children. And one of the big reasons I wanted to run in 2016 was to have better outcomes for our kids of color. And I think we've done that. There's still a lot of work that needs to that needs to happen in this district. But we added ethnic studies. It's now a, a legal requirement that every freshman in a public high school has ethnic studies. And we're doing that. We did it before the law mandated us to do so. Uh, we've just started this year AP African-American studies for our kids that now have an option, um, a, a historical perspective for their A through G requirements that didn't exist in, in Alameda before that. Uh, we have the scholar program where we're reaching out to, to kids of color that are struggling to give them those individualized supports that we know are working given the most recent um, look that we're, we, you know, the, the data that we're looking at in terms of our literacy rates that I mentioned earlier. So we are constantly looking at, um, you know, how we can support our kids of color. This work is ongoing, um, but uh, Shamar and her team are doing a great job reaching out to our families um, of color and making sure that um, not just educationally, but also um, in terms of their mental health, that the, that the supports they need to thrive and do well in this district are in place. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. All right, and Joyce? Um, great. Well, I, I have to say that um, I, I agree with Jen and all the things that she brought up. Um, what I'd like to add to that is I think someplace where we uh, maybe have an opportunity to do better. Now, uh, in Alameda, in our after school programs, we have uh, several. We have uh, Alameda Island Kids, we have Alameda Arts, we have Alameda Education Foundation. I have to say those are fantastic programs. My kids have been in all of them and we are just so fortunate to have them. Um, however, we do have um, a program which is Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. And one of the things that that provides for our, ki for our kids, particularly the kids who are struggling, it's that sort of enrichment activity, it's that opportunity to get some extra attention. And I think it's a program that's really uh, struggling. It's uh, a program out of state. It's a for-profit program. And I think we've had a lot of very dissatisfied parents with that program. And I think for us, it's a missed opportunity to particularly support our students who are struggling. And we know that in our schools, when we look at the scores, 
that we have certain groups of students who are really struggling. And this program should be particularly helping because students who qualify can go to this program for free. And so I, I think that the district is doing really good things, but I think this is a miss for the district. Thank you. Hey, thank you, okay. uh, Malia. Picking off, piggybacking off of what Joyce was talking about with ELOP, it's um, basically the after-school programming. And in the beginning of my teaching career, I ran the after-school program for um, Ralph Bunch in West Oakland. We had the highest gains in the history of OUSD, and our school was comprised of 200 students who were retained from eighth grade. Our increases in attendance were amazing. Our increases in um, students just feeling welcomed and families being engaged was because of the relationship between the after school program, which can be before school or after school, and the curriculum that was happening during the day. I completely agree that we need to make sure that those funds are being spent appropriately. What I did is I took a survey of all of my students and what my survey, what my students wanted the money to be spent on is how the money was spent. And obviously they made good choices because the results were amazing. I also want to um, talk about how important it is to support BIPOC teachers. As an African-American teacher, I have experienced many, many hard days in the educational system. And I think it's incredibly important that we recruit and retain BIPOC teachers. And we also need to look at individuals who speak more than one language. I would love to continue to expand the individuals who speak multiple languages and to honor that. Because as we know, individuals who speak more than one language, it's, it's so good for the brain. And so the more support that those families have in our community, I think it's gonna be have better outcomes for everyone. I also um, think that we need to focus on A to G requirements. Yatunde Reeves, who's a principal in principal, I mean, a principal in Baltimore has been having amazing results with the work that she's doing. Um, so I would love to see um, that improve. Thank you, Malia. Heather? Thanks, Anne. So um, while I've been on the board, I know that the board gave the district uh, direction to really focus on diversity and inclusion and representation in our hiring practices. And my understanding is we have definitely increased our representation among staff, uh, although I agree that there's definitely room to grow. Um, and not just for our black and brown students, but also for LGBTQ+. I know that we don't uh, that wasn't specifically mentioned. I agree with everything that board president uh, Williams said, but in addition um, to focus as well on that other population. In fact, we just had a um, group of students who were able to come uh, because our LGBTQ liaison, which this district did hire in order to ensure that we were bridging gaps and communication lapses, if you will, uh, came and presented to the board uh, this I guess it was this last Tuesday, and gave us some very sobering information um, and instruction on where we can do better. Um, that said, I'll also touch a little bit on the ELOP program. Uh, never before has this district been able to offer free after-school instructional education. To me, that program is an overwhelming uh, success. Um, there were definitely some bumps in the road in the beginning, but it has uh, seen a huge increase in interest, and I have actually received numerous emails from people who have resoundingly praised the program for what it's been able to do for their students. I think the ability to offer free uh, supplemental-based uh, child care, essentially, and education in an after-school setting where so many of our students have never been able to afford that before. It was an invaluable opportunity that has directly resulted in student achievement results. So, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Okay, and Heather, you will be up first for this next round of questions. Um, question four is on youth civic engagement, voting age. This November in Oakland and in Berkeley, 16 and 17 year olds may vote in their respective elections for school board. Would you support a similar Alameda measure that would allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote for their school board members? And so Heather? 100%. Um, I just had a recent graduate 
Um, I actually, he was able to register. I think all of our students were able to register at age, uh, I thought it was age 16. Yes. They were able to register to vote, but not necessarily able to vote. Um, they are young adults with bright minds. I 100% support that. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, and Jen. I absolutely support that as well. Um, we've actually been working closely with the League of Women Voters on increasing voter registration in our high schools this past month. I know Linda Bytoff has been instrumental in getting many more of our high school students registered to vote at both Encinal High and Alameda High. Uh, she just came to a board meeting last month and told us that the results have been incredible. So we are partnering with our non, uh, nonprofit partners in the community that are helping us come onto our campuses um, educate our kids about the value of voting and getting them signed up to vote. And I, I absolutely, 100% like Heather, uh, support these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce. All right. I, I want to make a distinction between uh, registering kids to vote, encouraging them to do that. I think that's a great idea and sort of telling them why that's so important. But um, I disagree with having 16 and 17 year olds vote for the school board. I, I And it's easy to say yes to it, but first of all, um, 18 in the category of 18 to 24 year olds, uh, the Chamber of Commerce recently had a presentation on who votes and what age votes. 7% of 18 to 24 year old votes vote. So we're not talking about a very big demographic. The registrar has also said this would require an entirely new system uh, because their current system can't just have 16 and 17 year olds join it and only be able to vote for school board. And they've actually said they won't do it unless the district pays for it. So that's a huge expense. So it's very easy to say, yes, what a great idea. But I think we've got to think about the budget impact, think about what the real effect on this and stay focused on getting our young people, telling them why it's important to vote and getting them registered to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And Malia. I absolutely support this. And I think that, um, you know, maybe we could have an initiative at the state level um, to see if we could get it changed as well. In high school, I fought with a number of other students so that students would get a seat on the school site council. Now, there was a lot of parents who did not want us to have a seat on the school site council. Um, but we fought and we, I think we got four seats on the school site council. It was a very large school site council. Um, and so I absolutely, I know how, I know how politically engaged I was as a high school student. And so, and I also know that high school students, 16 and 17 year olds, I always ask them questions. Who was your favorite teacher? What would you change? Who impacted you? Um, how could we better, how could you have been, been better supported? Um, their, in, their input is invaluable and I, they are, um, stakeholders that I hold in high regard because they have really, really sensitive and informative input. And so I absolutely agree that they should be able to vote. Um, I also think that we, uh, thank you, Pre President Williams, for talking about helping students get registered to vote. I also wanna always talk about, you know, making sure that we're focused on help supporting students who are visually impaired, deaf or hard of hearing, um, who may have cognitive delays, to also support those students as well. So as a special education teacher who worked in the transition age of 18 to 22 years, of students of 18 to 22, um, we also made sure that we educated our students um, in terms of what voting, was about and um, provided the accommodations and modifications that they needed to be able to vote and participate. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, next question, and Malia, you will be up first on this round. Um, this is on faculty recruitment and retention. Uh, what would be your approach to attracting and retaining great educators? What can AUSD do to provide affordable housing for teachers so they can live in the community? Well, this is a perfect question for myself. I lived in Alameda in the early 2000s as a teacher, a newer teacher, because I started teaching in 2000. And I had my goddaughter with me and she had her son as well. And I could not afford to live here. It was cheaper for me to move away and 
buy purchase a student not purchase but rent a studio for her and rent a studio for myself now i was able to come back to alameda and purchase a condo because of Alam alameda county boost so alameda county boost gives um assistance they give you a loan that you have over 30 years to pay off and so because of that that reduced my mortgage cost and i was able to purchase um, within the city of alameda so i am a strong proponent of programs like that below market rate housing um, there's plenty of cities dublin Novato, Emeryville, there's many cities in the area that have very strong below market rate housing where individuals can actually purchase a home. Um, I think that purchasing a home, the research shows that there's so many um, health factors that improve and social, just social factors in general when you're actually able to own your own home. And um, for somebody who, like myself, who's invested so much in my education so that I can be a better educator, um, I'm incredibly grateful for Alameda County for creating that program. I also, um, in terms of retention of teachers, culture is so incredibly important. I can't tell you how many teachers call me every other day in tears, not necessarily in this district, I'm not in many other districts across, across the East Bay. Um, we have to address the culture in the school setting. We have to address biases, biases that are against BIPOC teachers and teachers of um, in LGBTQ plus communities, we have to make sure that we are truly welcoming um, for all. Thank you. Thank you, Malia. Okay, Heather. Thanks, Anne. Um, this is where I think a really strong partnership that we've built with the city comes uh, into perspective. The school district doesn't have anything to do with De, you know, determining the cost of housing. However, our city with its agreements with its developers does and is able to establish that. And what I'm really, really happy about is uh, our teachers are often afforded um, points, if you will. Uh, I, I don't know the exact terminology, but they get, um, they get uh, top pick uh, a lot of the time on our uh, quote unquote affordable uh, housing. And I agree, Malia, we have to do better to try and bring the costs down on that. That said, um, in the last year, uh, board president and I have done a lot of, or have had a lot of conversations, uh, particularly with uh, Berkeley Unified School District's uh, superintendent about ways that we could potentially bring affordable housing and workforce housing in, uh, specifically into Alameda in order to provide that benefit. Um, as we've mentioned previously, uh, because of the way our district is funded and the limitations that we have due to the demographic population that we serve, we don't have a lot of extra funding that we can then shift and turn over uh, in terms of financial gain, but we might be able to have an opportunity to create a situation where we could have workforce housing. That said, it's not that easy, right? We have to do studies to determine, will people even want to have that? Uh, if they want it, what do they want? Do they want three bedrooms, two bedrooms, one bedroom? There's a lot of uh, background that needs to happen before we can make that move. But I believe that that will be part of the conversation if and when we do have available land in order to, uh, to that that will come up uh, for the on, the, on excuse me, on the table for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Jen. Thank you. Um, the, yeah, teacher housing is, is something we've struggled with for quite some time. Um, we have property on the base, both Miller School as well as the barracks quarters, and we've worked with developers closely, um, one developer for almost a year to see if we could um, strike a deal with them to get some type of teacher housing and employee housing going at the base, and it just wouldn't pencil out. These are things that we've tried um, historically to work on. But given the lack of infrastructure on the base where our property that we own is located, it's proven to be really difficult. Um, in the meantime, as Heather indicated, we've worked closely with the city, the, the housing authority as well, to create a point system in two properties, um, one specifically on Eagle Avenue where our, our staff gets an extra point for being an AUSD employee in the lottery system. And, and we, do ha we have had employees benefit um, from these, from these um, additional, you know, uh, point systems, if you will, um, and, as, and have helped them get into uh, permanent housing. But 
yeah, the struggle goes on. And what we can do in the meantime is pay our teachers a living wage. You know, thank goodness we've got the support of the Alameda community and recent parcel taxes um, where we are significantly contributing to our employees' wages. Um, and then just this last year, a historical agreement with our labor partners to cover a significant portion of their, for, for single payee, all of their health care costs. So in the meantime, while we don't have housing coming online, we will continue to work on that. But we are coming up with ways and thinking outside the box about how to pay our teachers a living wage. So at least they have more money in their pocket at the end of the day to help um, deal with the extreme housing costs that we all face here in the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Joyce. Oh, thank you. I, I, I have to say, I agree with all the other three candidates about what they've said. This is really a difficult one. Um, now, as I've said earlier, uh, I've been the chief financial officer in nonprofits and my particular specialty is affordable housing. Uh, I worked for the Alameda Housing Authority, um, so I'm very familiar with affordable housing in the city of Alameda. And I know e even if the funding were there, easily from the day you have an idea to when people can move in is a five-year process. So even if, if there were projects that were penciling out, um, those projects would take time to come online and be available for teachers. I think we also have the unfortunate situation where there had originally planned to be a bond for affordable housing uh, on the ballot this November. And that um, uh, bond measure was actually pulled off the ballot. So that even delays further having more money uh, to build affordable housing. And, um, you know, as both uh, Heather and Jen were saying, that the teachers can get uh, extra points to hopefully get into that affordable housing. Um, so I, I think that, you know, that we, again, pay our teachers as well as we can pay them so they can't afford to be here, have the below market rate housing programs. And when we have the opportunity to be able to help make workforce housing for our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joyce. Okay, so I'm gonna throw a little bit of, of a change in here because uh, we're, we have more than enough time for um, our, your closing statements, but I'd like to squeeze in one more question that we had. And if you each wouldn't mind, I'm going to put some pressure on you. And if we can do this in one minute, and I hope my timekeeper can say, I know it's, you'll see it's, 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 I think, I think you'll do fine. I trust all of you. So how's that? And if not, you can all be mad at me. Um, anyway, uh, this is just on general governance. And um, so on here, we'll start with Joyce. And the question is, what are your strategies for working with people when you don't agree? Uh. Well, I have to say that this is what I do uh, professionally, right? Uh, being the chief financial officer, I'm on the executive team. And when you work with an executive team, you're setting policies, you're going through budgets, you are not always going to agree with each other. And so the way I have approached this is you've, you've got to have trusting and honest relationships where folks can uh, have their opinion, where you can hash things out among yourself with an understanding that says, if we don't agree, if my opinion doesn't prevail, I'm still gonna uh, support what we've decided to do. I'm still gonna support my, uh, my board members and, um, and we're gonna remain a united team together. Thank you. Okay, Malia. So my motto is in every voice, there is a path to excellence. And that means every voice. That means individuals that I agree with and individuals that I don't agree with. Um, I think that one tool that I use a lot is using data um, because it's hard to argue with data. So, and using data visualization. I think it's really important that we communicate our thoughts clearly and in an effective way so that everyone can understand. I think that's incredibly helpful. I also like to use humor. 
<laughs> and so, for example, I was can canvassing this weekend and I met uh, someone who has some different political views than I. And so I used humor and I also let let him know that I think music can heal and music can bring folks together. And I always like to say that my cousin was Jimi Hendrix, which is true. So that tends to kind of cause folks to their anxiety to go down and then we can have a conversation about music and then move back to the policy. Thank you. Heather. Thanks, Anne. Um, I think it's really important to listen. Um, I do a lot of listening. I also think it's important to approach a conversation without judgment. And I also think it's important to recognize that it's okay to disagree. Um, I've been incredibly lucky, I think, since I've been on the board that I've only been part of maybe one or two contrarian uh, votes. Uh, this board has been in very homogenous in terms of the direction that we're going in, and that's been an incredible value. That said, in real life, that doesn't happen um, usually ever. I, I think that um, it's always important to, in, to recognize that people come with good intentions and that just because your opinion is different from them, it doesn't mean that it's any less valued. And I also agree, humor is important. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. So as an, as an administrative law judge during the day and being a lawyer for over 32 years, I literally oversee disputes all day. And quite frankly, I think that when people have different opinions, better decisions come out of it. I have the same philosophy and bring that same attitude to board work. Um, we are incredibly lucky to have a board that gets along, but it's not as though we always agree. Um, there have been times where we don't agree. But the one thing that we all do together is that we've made a commitment to the children and families and staff in this district that we serve, that we will put our own ideologies and political viewpoints aside for the best in, for the best interest, do the, doing the work, I should say, for the best interests of the constituents that we serve. We make a concerted effort to attend workshops just on board governance. We put the work in, we make effort to get along and to run meetings well. We're done with our meetings by nine o'clock, but it's because we are all on the same page about serving the public that elected us. Thank you. See, I told you, you guys could do it. <laughs> so that is the end of our question. So let's give everybody a chance to take a breath here before you do your closing statements. And so I'm going to take an opportunity now just to remind those that are here that if they'd be interested in more information or becoming part of the League of Women Voters, to please make sure and visit our website lwvalameda.org. Um, you can become a member there. You can find out about different events that we're doing or make a donation. We are 100% volunteer. So any of the programs that we put on or advocacy support that we do is done on behalf of those that support us. I also want to take this time to thank those who had sent in questions. We know we can't always get to all of the questions that you would like to ask, so we encourage you to reach out to the candidates with these questions. They all have different opportunities for you to do so and um, and find out, you know, get those questions answered because this is such an important race in our community. So, um, Thank you again for those who provided the questions because I just said them. Those I would love to take credit for them, but unfortunately I cannot. Um, anyway, then, uh, so why don't we move then into our closing statements and we'll be doing the reverse order of the ballot order on this one. So Jen, we'll be starting with you. Thank you. I just first want to say thank you to the Alameda League of Women Voters as well as to the Post. Adam, thank you both uh, your organizations for hosting this event. It's super important for our community that we have these opportunities to get to share our opinions and our belief systems and our values with the people that will be voting for us. So thank you very much. Um, I think that we're at a critical point in public education. We are incredibly lucky in the Alameda community that we have a functioning school district. We have labor peace. We are fiscally sound. It does not take much to look around us in Alameda County to see dysfunction um, across the Bay in San Francisco to see massive dysfunction that ultimately is not serving the kids that we are all here um, to serve. So we are doing a good job in Alameda. There is a lot of work that needs to be done. Absolutely. But the folks that are on this board right now and in place are doing the right work and i would love to have everybody's support that's that's listening in tonight thank you thank you jen heather 
Thanks, Anne. Um, I will echo a deep appreciation for Adam, Anne, and Keisha, and uh, League of Women Voters, as well as the Alameda Post for offering us this opportunity and also rescheduling so that everybody would be able to attend. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I am running for re-election for a second term. Why? Because I love this work. This is a community that I have lived in for a very long time. I have had my hand in many pots, whether it be Alameda Soccer Club, whether it be Girls Inc., whether it be Alameda Family Services, you name it. I have been a part of those various organizations that have really kind of solidified my 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 foundation in this community. And being on the board has been the, uh, the greatest honor of my life. I would be incredibly appreciative if this community would reelect me and I would actually also wholeheartedly support Jen's reelection. And I hope whoever ends up in that third seat uh, is able to join us and continue this great work. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Malia. So I am incredibly excited to be able to run for school board here in Alameda. 13 years ago, when I lived in Berkeley, I ran for school board there. There was 10 candidates for a special election and I was the runner up. Um, and since then I have been studying school budgets. I have been studying governance. I have been studying policies. I have gone to the state level and got some policies passed um, around school safety and making sure that our staff and our students um, and our faculty are safe in our school setting. I love this city. I grew up in a very small town in upstate New York, and Alameda reminds me of Schenectady in so many different ways. It's about the same size, about the same number of schools, and um, I am looking forward to being on the school board for hopefully many, many years. Um, as I hope you've learned from from my from what I've shared today, that this is truly my life mission and this is my passion. So I hope you'll consider voting for me. Thank you, Malia and Joyce. Yes, thank you to the League and the Alameda Post for sponsoring this event. Um, and I want to say, if you want to learn more about me, it is Joyce4AUSD.com, uh, and that four is the digit four. Uh, and I want to summarize and say that the things I'm particularly think I'd like us to be focusing on are academic excellence, uh, particularly with a focus on literacy by the third grade and also career and college readiness. And I think that with our advanced placement classes that we need to make that process more transparent. Um, I think it's an area where we need more equity. I think we have a lot of parents very confused by the process. Um, I also think that, um, uh, that Alameda is a destination school and, um, and I think we are, are gonna remain that. And I think we'll have a strong school board no matter who's elected here. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And thank you all for taking your time, not only to be part of this forum, but for being willing to do the hard work that it takes to support our schools. Um, for those in the audience, ballots were mailed on October 7th. If you haven't received them, you may want to check in with the Registrar of Voters. And uh, if you have received them, we certainly hope this forum has helped you in making your decision. So, Adam, I'll send it down to you to close it up. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you very much, Anne, for all your hard work this evening and being a wonderful moderator. And also to Kesha and all the people involved at the League of Win Voters who made this evening happen. Uh, again, the League uh, offers all sorts of information, as does the Alameda Post. You can find out more at alamedapost.com slash election. And I believe vote411.org is a site where you can get up-to-date information about candidates and what's on the ballot. Uh, but thank you all for joining us tonight. And please follow the Alameda Post for more coverage of the election. And uh, join up with the League of Women Voters for more uh, information about voting and other election information. And thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you to all the candidates. Thanks to the audience. Good night, everybody. Good night.